The pilots of this MD-87 is just lining their aircraft up for an early morning departure in Milan. The fog outside of the cockpit window is dense as they set takeoff thrust and start accelerating down the runway. As the aircraft start rotating, they suddenly see a black shadow and an anti-collision light appearing straight ahead. How was this possible? Stay tuned. A huge thank you to CuriosityStream for sponsoring this video. The terrible chain of events that led up to the Linate airport disaster on the 8th of October 2001 actually started many, many years earlier. And in order for us to understand it, we have to go way back in the history of the airport where it happened. There are three main airports that are serving the city of Milan in northern Italy. One is Milan Bergamo. The other one is Milan Malpensa, and the third one is Milan Linate, of which we're going to be talking about today. Milan Linate is the most central situated out of these airports, and it started its story back in the 1930s. And then after the Second World War, it became more and more popular as the tourism industry increased in Italy. This meant that the airport went through several upgrades during the 1960s, 1970s, and also in the 1990s. There are two runways in Milan Lenate. The main runway, 36 right, which serves all commercial traffic and larger business jets. And then the much smaller runway 36 left, which is only 600 meters long and only serves general aviation aircraft. To the right of the main runway, there is the North Apron. And the North Apron is where all the commercial flights are parked. That's connected to the passenger terminal. And the other apron is called the West Apron, which is just to the west of the smaller runway 36 left. Now on the West Apron, all private jets and all general aviation aircraft are normally parked. As I mentioned before, there had been major upgrades to Linarte Airport over the years, but most of those upgrades had happened on the main runway, 36 right, and on the north apron and connected taxiways. The western part of the airport had been largely neglected in these upgrades, and that meant that taxiway markings and taxiway signs had started to degrade a bit. But that wasn't a big problem because aircraft and most pilots that were operating out of the western apron were mostly very familiar with the airport. That had also started to develop a kind of complacency without traffic control, where air traffic control maybe wasn't listening too carefully to what aircraft that was going out on that part of the airplane was saying. And there was also frequently use of Italian as a language mixed up with English from the commercial side of the airport. So you had a frequent mix of two languages going on, and that's gonna play a bit of a role in this accident. One upgrade that had happened to the western side of the airport was the addition of a new taxiway called Romeo 6. This taxiway was built back in the 1960s when the airport started to recognize that a lot of the private jets that were operating from the western apron needed access to the main runway, runway 36 right, because they were just becoming too big to use the smaller runway. Because this taxiway was a later addition, it meant that it didn't follow the standard Ikao marking system. The way that normally works is that if you put a needle down in the main runway and you start from 12 o'clock position, then you start marking the taxiways Romeo 1, Romeo 2, Romeo 3, Romeo 4, Romeo 5 and Romeo 6 in a clockwise movement. But in this case, they were marked Romeo 1, Romeo 2, Romeo 3, Romeo 4, Romeo 6 and then Romeo 5. From where the Romeo 6 taxiway intersected the main runway 36 right and all the way to the west apron, there was not a single vertical sign that showed that this taxiway was actually called Romeo 6. However, there were some other markings that were written on the taxiway surface called Sierra 4 and Sierra 5. Those markings had been put there after a meeting with the airport where they thought that they had to expand the um, parking capability of the West Apron, but that never really came to fruition, which meant that the tower was not made aware of these markings, and that's gonna become very important soon. Another thing that happened during the mid-1990s was that the taxiway lighting system was upgraded. Generally, if an airport is supposed to work during low visibility conditions, you need these green center taxi line lights. And they were added to most of the airport. That included taxiway Romeo 6. From runway 36 towards the west apron, initially the uh, lighting was alternating yellow and green. And then you had a red stop bar at the Cat 3 holding position at Romeo 6. 
And then these green centerline lights continued all the way to the start of the west apron. Coming from the other direction, from the west apron towards the runway, you could see the green centerline lights and then you had the red stop bar and then the green taxi line lights continued. Now these type of taxi line lights need to be controlled by the tower so that the tower can, for example, illuminate a section of the green taxi line lights up to the red stop bar and then remove the green lights beyond the stop bar. That way giving a very clear indication to taxiing aircraft that they have to stop. But something happened to this taxi line system around 1998, where all of a sudden the tower was unable to control these lights. They could either have them all on or all off, which meant that if the green taxi line light was going to be used, you would always have the red stop bar illuminated as well. This led to a situation where pilots who were familiar with the airport were also familiar with having to cross that red stop bar in order to enter the runway after receiving clearance from air traffic control. And I cannot overemphasize how important of a detail this is because as a pilot, we are taught to never, ever, ever cross a red stop bar. So to have as a standard operating procedure at an airport that you have to cross a illuminated red stop bar in order to comply with a further taxi clearance, that is in my ears complete insanity. And if you put on top of that, that the taxiway holding point guard system, which is a laser beam that is supposed to monitor all active holding points to make sure that no aircraft or vehicle inadvertently enters into an active runway without ATC clearance was also inoperative since back in 1998. Now you're starting to see that all of the latent threats in Dr. Reason's Swiss cheese model is starting to add up and we haven't even gotten to the worst point yet. Because in 1994 the uh, Linate airport management started talking about replacing the ground radar on Linate. But for some reason these plans were never implemented. So that meant that in 1999 when the old ground radar system stopped working it was never replaced. In the very early morning of the 8th of October 2001, a Cessna Citation 525 took off from Cologne in Germany and made its way down towards Milan Lenate. The aircraft was owned by a private German citizen, but he had started up an AOC recently and was in the process of moving this aircraft ownership over towards this AOC, this company. But on this day, the flight plan indicated that this was a private flight and the aircraft was supposed to land in Milan Linate, pick up another passenger and then fly up to Paris. Both of these flights were going to be paid for by the Cessna company because the person that was being picked up in Linate was a potential Cessna Citation customer. The Citation was flown by two experienced pilots, but both the Citation itself and these pilots were limited to fly down to category one limitations. This meant that the worst visibility that they could land an aircraft in was 550 meters and the worst visibility they can take off with was 400 meters. But as they started to get closer to Linate and they took the weather, they realized that the weather was way worse than that. The wind was calm, visibility was only about 100 meters with overcast clouds at 100 feet and RVR, which is the runway visual range, was 175, 200 and 225 meters, which is well below category one minimums. However, the airport had not yet started to issue low visibility procedures and did not say on the 80s that the category three ILS approaches were in force. Now, that doesn't really matter because as a pilot, you need to keep track of what your lowest visibility is. And if the weather is worse than that, you are not able to land. It's as easy as that. However, the crew of this citation started their approach anyway. And at the time 04.59 and 34 seconds, they touched down on runway 36 right in Lenate. After the landing, the pilots asked if they could make a short backtrack on the runway and exit on taxiway Romeo 6 to taxi to their parking position on the west apron. Air traffic control cleared them to do this and it showed that these two pilots, they were quite familiar with the taxiway layout of Lenate. At the same time as this is happening, a Scandinavian Airlines flight 686 was getting ready for departure over on the north apron. The aircraft being used was an MD-87 and in the cockpit there were two very experienced pilots, both of them whose training records showed that they were above average skill. Together with them there were four cabin crew members and 104 passengers being boarded. At time 0541 and 39 seconds, the first officer of the Scandinavian flight requests startup clearance. The air traffic controller on the ground frequency gives them the startup clearance and also advises them that they have a slot restriction at time 0616. 
Now, a slot restriction is basically a defined time window when an aircraft is allowed to depart. In this case, it's five minutes before and 10 minutes after, so between 0611 to 0626. This is very common, especially when there's low visibility procedures in use, because there's a limitation on how many aircraft movements there can be on the airport at any given time. The first officer read back the startup clearance and the slot time, and the pilots now completed their final flight deck preparation. At time 0554 and 23 seconds, the MD87 have started off both engines and the pilots are now ready for taxi. They request taxi clearance and the ground controller responds and tells Scandinavian 686 to taxi to holding position, runway 36, and to call him back when they enter the main taxiway. This is then read back by the first officer and the MD87 slowly starts moving through the fog towards the holding position. The airport is now beginning to get really busy with both a couple of aircraft arriving and quite a few aircraft departing for the first morning wave. About four minutes after the Scandinavian starts taxiing, the Cessna citation on the western apron calls up the ground controller and asks for startup clearance. The ground controller gives the aircraft their startup clearance and they also give them their departure IFR clearance and this departure clearance was incorrectly read back by the pilot which was picked up and corrected by the ground controller. As part of the ATC clearance the Cessna Citation pilots also get a slot restriction which is at 0619 three minutes after the departure of the Scandinavian aircraft. As the clearance is being given to the Cessna Citation, the MD-87 from Scandinavian Airlines have been slowly moving their way down towards the main taxiway. Just as the conversation finishes, the MD-87 pilot calls up the ground controller and tells them that they're now on the main taxiway abeam the fire station. The ground controller responds and tells the pilot to switch over to the tower controller on frequency 118.1. And this is normally the way that it works, where you have the ground controller that is handling all the traffics on the taxiways and apron, and then as the aircraft is getting ready to enter the active runway, they will switch over to a tower controller, which is a different frequency. But this also means that this is the last time that the Cessna Citation and the Scandinavian Airlines MD-87 are sharing the frequency. After this, these two aircraft are going to be talking on two different frequencies. The Scandinavian pilot checks in on the new frequency and the tower controller tells them to continue towards the holding position from with 36 right and that they're number four in the queue for departure. Now before we get into the actual accident sequence, I just want to share this short message from my sponsor. Now I know that you guys are watching my videos because you love learning new things and finding out the nitty gritty nerdy details behind each story. And if that's true, you should seriously check out the sponsor of this episode, which is CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is a high-quality subscription streaming service with thousands of great non-fictional stories and documentaries from some of the best filmmakers in the world. A video that I am watching right now is Heavy Lift, the Anton of Dream about the Anton of 225, which obviously is really sad right now, but still very important to watch. If you think, Peter, that sounds really interesting. Well then, consider supporting me by supporting my sponsor. Go down into the description, click on the link, which is curiositystream.com slash mentorpilot and the coupon code mentorpilot. That will give you a whopping 25% off the annual subscription fee, which is, wait for it, only $14.99 per year, which is insane value for money. Now back to the video. At time 06, 05 and 44 seconds, the uh, Cessna Citation calls up the ground controller once again, this time asking for a taxi clearance. The ground controller responds with the following clearance. Delta Victor X-ray. Taxi north via Romeo 5, QNH 1013, coming back at the stop bar of the main runway extension. The Citation pilot then responds, Roger, via Romeo 5 and 1013 and call you back before reaching the main runway. Now if you pay a bit of attention here, you see that the readback does not match the actual clearance. The actual clearance both tells the aircraft to turn towards the north, taxi via Romeo 5 and hold before the runway extension. The readback from the citation does include the correct taxiway, Romeo 5, but it also says call you back before reaching the main runway. So these are two different things, and this is not picked up and not corrected by the ground controller. This is very important, because there is a chance right now that the pilots in the Cessna Citation have a mental picture of how they are going to taxi, and they think that they are going to taxi back the same way as they taxied in, which is the closest connection to the active runway. 
However, they do read back Romeo 5, which is the northerly taxiway. Only 30 seconds after this, another aircraft that was parked on the Western Apen, Lima X-Ray Papa Romeo Alpha, also called up the ground controller and asked for taxi clearance. This aircraft received the same taxi instruction as the Citation had just received, with the additive that they had to hold position until the Cessna Citation taxied in front of them before they could start taxi. Now, if the Citation pilots would have heard this taxi clearance, it is likely that that would have updated their situational awareness a little bit, knowing that they needed to taxi past another aircraft before they reached Romeo 5. But unfortunately, this whole conversation was made in Italian, so the German pilots in the Citation would not have understood it. Two minutes later, the Citation pilot calls up the ground controller and tells him that he is approaching Sierra 4. The ground controller gets a little bit confused by this because he is not aware of any holding position named Sierra 4. Remember, those are the markings that was put onto Romeo 6, but no one ever told air traffic control about. The ground controller just asks, uh, Delta Victor X-Ray, confirm your position? And the citation, Delta Victor X-Ray, responds, um, we're approaching the runway, Sierra 4. Now this is another opportunity to solve this confusion. The problem is that this only plays further into the perceived situation that the ground controller has in his head that the citation is indeed taxiing via Romeo 5 and that they're holding short of the runway extension for runway 36 right. The ground controller responds with Delta Victor X-ray, Roger, maintain the stop bar, I'll call you back. So let's recap the situation as it stands right now because this is a very crucial part of this accident. The ground controller is convinced that Delta Victor X-ray is holding at the holding position at the runway extension on Romeo 5. The pilots in the Cessna Citation have just been told to hold at the stop bar to get further clearance. Now they are on Romeo 6. That is the wrong taxiway, they read back Romeo 5, but it's also very likely that they have a mental model that they should be on Romeo 6. And in any case, during their taxi so far, there have been no signs along the taxiway that they're actually on Romeo 6 and not on Romeo 5. After this conversation, the ground controller calls up another aircraft which is on the north apron. And the reason he's doing this is to make sure that the taxiway is clear for the Cessna Citation to continue taxiing through the north apron and on to the main taxiway for the holding point from a 36 right. When he gets confirmation that this other aircraft has moved out of the way, he calls up the Cessna Citation again. The clearance that the ground controller now gives the Cessna Citation is Delta Victor X-Ray, continue taxi on the main apron, follow the Alpha line. The Citation pilot responds with Roger, continue taxi in main apron, Alpha line the Delta Victor X-Ray. The ground controller then continues with Yep, that's correct, and please call me back entering the main taxiway. Now, we will never really know exactly what conversations that took place inside of the Cessna Citation cockpit. And the reason for that is that the Cessna Citation did not have a cockpit voice recorder. It was not required on aircraft of that size. But it is likely that this last clearance where the ground controller tells them to continue on to the north apron, then onto the alpha line and then subsequently on to the main taxiway, could be understood as a clearance to cross the active runway onto the north apron and then turning right onto the main taxiway. Because what happens next is that the Cessna Citation now taxis past a big white stop mark, which is painted onto the taxiway. They then continue past some holding point markings, which are painted yellow on the taxiway. And then they cross a red lit stop bar. Remember the one that we talked about in the beginning of the video? The one that could not be turned off unless you wanted to turn off all of the taxi line lighting? Yeah, that one. And since these pilots are familiar with Linate, it's very possible that they have gotten the clearance to taxi past red stop bars before at this airport. Next to the red stop bar, there's also a CAT3 holding point vertical sign. And then they taxi past another holding point marking on the taxiway before they enter the active runway 36 right. This is all happening on the ground frequency. And the Scandinavian Airlines flight 686 is on the tower frequency. They have been in line, but now they are getting a clearance to enter and line up the runway 36 right. At time 06, 09 and 28 seconds, the tower controller, whilst he's talking to another aircraft, ends off the transmission with giving the full takeoff clearance for Scandinavian Airlines flight 686. 
the pilots inside of the MD-87 reads back uh, clear for takeoff from the 3-6 and when airborne squawk ident and we're rolling Scandinavian 686. The captain now sets takeoff thrust and the aircraft starts accelerating down the runway. The visibility outside of the cockpit windows is still really bad. It's only about 200 meters, which means that they can only see a few centerline lights ahead of them as they're accelerating. The first officer calls out 130 knots, which is checked by the captain. He then calls out V1, rotate, and the aircraft start rotating. As the nose wheel comes off the ground, a signal is automatically sent via the aircraft's ACAR system to the Scandinavian Airlines headquarters in Copenhagen, saying that the aircraft has taken off. Only about 4.8 seconds after the initiation of the rotation, a black shadow and an anti-collision light appears in front of the pilots of the MD-87. Half a second before the impact, an unreadable word is said on the cockpit voice recorder, indicating that the pilots did indeed see something. Then, at time 0610 and 21 seconds, the MD-87 collide with the Cessna Citation abeam the Romeo 6 taxiway intersection. The first point of impact is the nose gear of the MD-87, who touches the horizontal stabilizer of the Citation. The second point of impact, which is much more severe, is the right-hand main landing gear of the MD-87, who first touches the right-hand wing and then slams into the body of the Citation, completely destroying the aircraft and most likely killing everyone on board. The force of that impact is so severe that it cuts the right-hand landing gear straight off. The gear is then pushed backwards, it damages the right hand flaps on the wing of the MD-87 before it flies further back and jams itself between the engine pylon and the right hand engine. That impact causes the right hand engine to immediately fail and then separate the aircraft. That causes a number of electrical failures inside of the MD-87 and after this follows numerous contacts between the two aircraft before the MD-87 gets airborne. Inside of the cockpit, the pilots are now struggling to maintain control of their badly damaged aircraft. They get as high as 35 feet, which is about 10 meters, before the left-hand engine, who has likely ingested a lot of debris from the collision, now also starts failing. Without any of the engines functioning, the aircraft cannot continue to fly and now starts descending back onto the runway. It touches down towards the very end of runway 36 right at a speed of about 166 knots. When it does so, because it's now lacking its right-hand landing gear, the right-hand wing touches the ground and starts to pivot the aircraft towards the right. The pilots in the cockpit are now trying to maintain directional control of their aircraft. We know this because they did select the left-hand reversers to activate on their now failing left-hand engine. They did this likely to try to slow the aircraft down because all brakes had failed at this point because of the damage to the hydraulic systems during the impact. But also the fact that they did this now caused a bit of asymmetrical thrust on the left hand side which also helped them to slightly maintain control. But since the right hand wing was touching the ground the whole aircraft continued to pivot up to an angle of about 45 degrees as the aircraft careered off the runway. But it has been shown in tests after the disaster that if it weren't for these last heroic actions by the flight crew, the trajectory of the aircraft would have been more towards the right, where it could have impacted parked aircraft that were being boarded for departure and also the terminal building, potentially causing many, many more people to lose their lives. Sadly, there was nothing more the pilots could do. The aircraft did not slow down. Instead, it continued in a slight right turn trajectory after it left the runway until it crashed into a baggage handling building. When it crashed into the building, it came to a complete stop from 149 knots and that caused the roof of the building to collapse down onto the aircraft and a violent fire to immediately break out. This was a completely non-survivable event and all 110 passengers and crew plus four workers inside of the building immediately perished. This was the second worst on-ground aircraft collision accident in history, only second to the terrible Tenerife disaster. But the story does not end here. Because of the dense fog and because of the lack of situational awareness inside of the air traffic control tower, the fact that this accident had even happened did not become clear to the tower controllers for several minutes after the disaster. About 49 seconds after the crash, the first phone call came into the tower. 
The person who called said that he heard something that sounded like explosions from the runway. But the uh, tower controller didn't know exactly what he was talking about. He didn't have any other indications of anything being wrong. So he largely disregarded it. The second thing that happened was that a police officer that was stationed outside of the airport perimeter next to one of the airport gates called directly to the airport firefighting units and said that he could see fire coming off the baggage handling uh, building and he could also see people who seemed to have been hurt coming out of the building. This caused the airport firefighters to immediately launch a couple of their uh, firefighting vehicles towards the baggage handling building but this was never really communicated with air traffic control tower. Instead, the tower controller, about two minutes after the crash had happened, was trying to reach the Scandinavian aircraft on the radio. Remember, they were supposed to squawk ident that would show them up on this radar screen, but he couldn't see them. Instead, he called to the other air traffic control sectors around to see if the Scandinavian aircraft had called in on their sector instead. But none of the others had heard anything. About 20 seconds after the tower controller had made these calls, a pilot from one of the aircraft that was still standing at the gate called up the tower and said that he had been speaking to his dispatcher. And the dispatcher had said that he'd heard explosions and he'd seen something that looked like a fire that had streaked down the runway and disappeared into the fog. Now, the air traffic controllers are starting to put two and two together. And at the time 06, 13 and 30 seconds, they push the alarm button in the tower. After this follows a sequence of almost complete confusion in the tower where the air traffic controllers are trying to figure out what has happened. They're also trying to control all of the aircraft that are still out there because so far they have no idea what has actually happened. There's a huge lack of communication between the air traffic controllers and the firefighting units. So bad that when a traffic control tells the leading units of the uh, firefighters that they need to send someone out to do a runway inspection to see if there's something on the runway, this is not understood as a direct order and subsequently is not being done. As a result of this, it takes almost 30 minutes before an aircraft that is taxiing along the main taxiway calls into tower and says that he can see that something is burning on the runway. The uh, traffic controller then contacts the uh, firefighting services again and asks them whether or not they have completed that runway inspection, which they say they haven't done. Now they send out the unit and they finally, after 36 minutes, find the wreckage of the Cessna citation on the runway. They quickly extinguish the fire and they report that back to our traffic control. The investigation into this terrible accident resulted in one of the most scathing reports that I've ever read against a airport and a national aviation authority. The investigation basically said that there was a lack of organization at Linate Airport that stemmed from several different authorities not working well together. There was a lack of a proper safety management system and a toxic reporting environment existed where people were afraid to report what they saw as potential safety issues out of fear of being fired. It was found that the accident was directly caused by the poor visibility on the day. Then the lack of visual guidance aids and signatures on the uh, taxiway most likely caused the Cessna citation to take the wrong taxiway. There was no further signage that could indicate to the uh, Cessna that they were on the wrong taxiway. And there was also a lack of situational awareness between the tower and the Cessna citation that eventually caused them to enter the active runway and led up to the collision. No one did at any point question the fact that the Cessna citation landed in lower minima than they were allowed to do according to their flight plan and that they also taxied out in much worse condition than they were allowed to take off from. The reason that the pilots of the citation actually did so we're never really going to know but it is likely that some commercial pressure was involved. Further to this the report also talked about the improper use of both English and Italian on the same frequency, uh, the incorrect readback from the pilots that weren't properly caught by air traffic control, and they also found that there wasn't any proper recurrent training being given to the air traffic controllers at Linate Airport. It was also found that the lack of ground radar and the monitoring system at the holding point at Romeo 6 also contributed to the accident. All in all, this led up to a stunning 18 different recommendations that had to be implemented in order to make Linate more safe. The investigators were stunned to realize that just 24 hours prior to this fatal runway incursion, another runway incursion had happened and that this was a fairly common occurrence on the airport. 
This accident has led to many improvements in the aviation business, especially during low visibility procedures and how airports put up signs and how they conduct themselves in foggy conditions. But to finish off, when I read through this report, I just felt so bad for the pilots in the MD-87. They did everything right from when they pushed back the aircraft to the collision and even after the collision. Their skills and airmanship shone through throughout this horrible, horrible story. And it likely stopped this accident from becoming an even bigger disaster. Now, if you want to see the video I did about the world's worst on-ground aircraft collision, well then, check out the video up here. If you want to support me in the work that I do, you can buy yourself some merch or you can take part in my Patreon crew. I know that you will like it in there and I'd love to see you in my next weekly hangout. Bye bye.